Atheist Nomads episode 396, The Satanic Temple with Lucian Greaves in 2021. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and in a little bit, I'll be joined by Lucian Greaves from The Satanic Temple. Before we get to the interview, we have one announcement this week, which is... Episode 400 is coming right up around the corner. <laughs> yeah, we're already on 396, <laughs> so we're right there. Um, so we'll be doing a live stream on Saturday, March 20, which is the spring equinox this year. So that'll be pretty awesome. Times the Timing works out pretty perfect for that, so might as well try and make that a little bit special. Have a 2021 equinox party celebrating 400th episode of the podcast in the 2020-2021 style. So sure, <laughs> that should be, should be a lot of fun. Uh, I did start the precedent with episode 100 of doing a 100 minute live stream. And then episode 200 was a 200 minute live stream. And episode 300 was 300 minutes. And episode 400 will be about an hour maybe a little longer. It's going to be a normal episode. I'm not going to be trying to go 400 minutes. That would be ridiculously stupid and insane. So not even going to bother going for that. So put it on your calendars. Um, the link will be up soon for it on, uh, at atheistnomads.com slash live. And, uh, I will be trying to book some people to join us for it and it should be a lot of fun so be sure to check that out on march 20 at two o'clock p.m mountain time and whatever the hell that is in your time zone we are now joined by lucian greaves from the satanic temple lucian welcome back to atheist nomads great to be back been a while and i said back yes because uh, you were last on episode 93 which was nearly six years ago. What episode will this be? Uh, this is going to, this is uh, 396. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so yeah, it's been a, it's been a little while. Um, so when we last talked, um, well, actually, I guess before we even get to that, how did this, what is the Satanic Temple? We didn't cover that the first time. I think we did, but it's been <laughs> six years. There's, there's right, yeah. listeners who didn't listen then. <laughs> Well, uh, the Satanic Temple is a non-theistic, satanic, worldwide religious organization, now recognized by the IRS as something different. It wasn't recognized oh, wow. back, in, yeah, back then, so we're, we're a tax-exempt, federally recognized church. And uh, it's important to note that we're non-theistic in that we do not subscribe to supernaturalism, don't advocate for any supernaturalist beliefs, uh, but we are a religious community and we have a set of ethic, ethics and uh, deeply held beliefs that we feel are uh, just as legitimately protected as any others that fall under the religious classification. And we're not quiet about fighting for that kind of equal rights for our mm -hmm. religious viewpoint, which is what I think most people already know about us and in fact people knew that about us last time i was on but i think what's also becoming more apparent to people since the hail satan documentary has come out and since we've had such a vast growing population of identified satanists building our community around us is that people are more and more realizing just to what degree this is an authentic religious identity to the people who are members of the satanic temple. Okay. And so obviously not devil worshipers. Correct. Yeah. We uh, are perfectly comfortable with our Satan as a literary construct and as an iconic metaphorical figure that stands for the ultimate rebel against tyranny. And to that end, you know, we're always pushing back against theocratic encroachments. Again, what we're most popular for, but at the individual level, you know, our, our membership is very much invested in their self-betterment and personal autonomy. Okay, so a little bit closer to if 
somebody were to create a Santa Claus religion based on gift giving, those people wouldn't actually believe in or worship a guy with a white beard who lives on the North Pole. It'd be a literary construct. More so, more so like that than say the uh, kind of rebirth of some of like the Norse religions. Um, well, you know, or even similar to that, maybe. You, you don't even have to hypothesize about other manifestations of non-theistic religions because there's other non-theistic religious constructs all around, mm -hmm. and we're not too terribly unique. Jainism is a non-theistic religion. Confucianism, uh, a lot of manifestations of Buddhism, and to be honest, even mainstream religions have a lot of secular manifestations or non-theistic uh, cultural groups. There's a lot of non-theistic Jews, for example, still practice the rites and uh, still have that as their sense of community, but don't believe in, uh, don't believe literally in the tales of the Old Testament. Right. And I think that that's progress. And I think as time goes on, the more religious groups, religious uh, uh, identifications become comfortable with being able to acknowledge reality and not feeling that they can only sustain their sense of community and identity by at least claiming to subscribe to intellectually insulting superstitious beliefs, we'll all be a bit better off. Well, and we're even starting to see that in, you know, in, in Christianity, you've got Unitarianism, of course, is well past being Christian, but you're starting to get it more with the Congregationalists and um, Episcopals and some other churches that are kind of moving past what would traditionally be viewed as religion while maintaining a community and tradition and all of that. Right. Uh, and there's also the Clergy Project, which is a, uh, an online place and resource for people who are still part of their religious communities, but just can't believe in, in what they're supposed to believe in anymore, at least not in, uh, in a literal sense, right? But they're still, for whatever reason, attached to that community or, you know, maybe even the ethics and teachings uh, to a certain degree, uh, just not uh, believers in the literal truth. And, and that population is growing, and that population is growing more and more. And I think uh, that population will be far more amenable to arguing facts over simply, um, simply relying upon biblical edicts to, to argue their point. And that's why I think we'll be better off. Uh, if not theistic uh, expressions of religion become dominant. Oh, yeah. Well, and like you look at the, the uh, Pew surveys where it's somewhere around 75 or 80 percent of Americans identify as a member of a religion, but only about two thirds of Americans actually say that they believe in a God or gods. Yeah. Um, and you also see that somewhere over 50 percent of Americans are going to refuse to be vaccinated too uh, mm -hmm. for COVID. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to think. You know, I, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, encouraging stats and a lot of depressing ones. When we hear about yeah. belief and alien abduction and things like that, the numbers are horrifically high. Uh, but there is some kind of indication that when it comes to these kinds of uh, fundamental mythologies uh, predicated upon religion, that the numbers are dwindling through time more and more as well. But at the same time, uh, you know, Christian nationalism is becoming, uh, or has become a, a very potent and harmful political force. And it's uh, a real mistake, I think, to uh, sit back now and celebrate the death of, of superstitious theocratic religion. Right, because yeah, the, the trends, the trends in demographics are heading the right direction. The trends politically are going the opposite direction. Right. Uh, well, you you had a, a real concentrated effort from uh, this, different religious evangelical groups mm -hmm. to insert themselves into politics. And, you know, you might look at that as the, the last stand and say that this this can't this can't sustain. And this is kind of the death throes. But it could also really be uh, an effective last stand that could uh, lead to a revival as well. And it takes 
everything we have to push back because my feeling is is that you know we really saw the an attempt at the theocratic coup during the trump administration and you see the capital riots you know you see people erecting crosses dressed as as templars and uh really uh really explicitly you know demanding that the United States be turned into a Christian nation. And when you see the kind of battles that the Satanic Temple is fighting, merely asking for equal access, where they open public forums to religious expression, we see, you know, the bald hypocrisy in their arguments, their constitutional arguments, that uh, they're just trying to defend religious liberty by opening up these public grounds to religious expression at all, mm-hmm. because they absolutely deny that the Satanic Temple has any right to that type of expression. And they're very openly now advocating for exclusive rights or elevated rights for Mm -hmm. Christian expression. And now, you know, before the Satanic Temple came along, the argument was always that they wanted to put up a Ten Commandments monument or put uh, prayer in public schools or whatever with the understanding that if other religious groups wanted to be involved, there's no problem there because we have religious liberty and that's what it is. But they never counted on people actually expressing that, people demanding that. Then we came along and what we're seeing now, and probably people don't realize because they might not follow these things as closely as we do because we're on the front lines all the time, is that now the argument is migrating towards exclusive Christian rights. And the argument is being made that these Christian expressions are such an integral part of American heritage and history that local governments or government agencies do have a right to give them certain preference over any other type of expression, and that certain communities do have a right to claim majoritarian rule on these types of things and keep others out. And we're yet to see where those arguments will go, but given how many federal judges Trump put into place, we can't rely on the courts of law to be neutral. And even scarier is the trend towards using voter suppression and intimidation tactics and gerrymandering and court packing and all of that to ensure minority rule of a very specific Christian nationalist angle. Right. Well, that's that's part of the hypocrisy of the argument, too. Still, uh, according to polls, a majority of people are for uh, Roe versus Wade being upheld and not being overturned. Mm-hmm. And yet you have this very loud minority doing everything they can to overturn it or to pass laws that make it prohibitive to exercise that right to get an abortion on demand. And uh, they're making great headway, as we can see. And now, uh, you know, for the first time, really, since Roe versus Wade in the 70s, you know, we're in fear of it being overturned by a uh, w- dramatically con- uh, conservative Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, you know, when we last had you on the show, it was 2015. Same sex marriage had just been made the law of the land by the U.S. Supreme Court. And now here in 2021, it's quite possible that even if that doesn't go away, yeah, access to abortion could. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people didn't think that we would get here or that we could get here uh, so quickly. Um, Well, as as a lot of people see it so quickly, I think, you know, we saw it coming for some time now. We took the the motions of the, the theocratic right seriously. Uh, back during the Obama administration, when I think everybody felt uh, uh, very comfortable that that this this wasn't really a problem, but it, it really rebounded and, and smacked us in the face with the Trump administration. I think more people are taking it seriously now, but uh, still much fewer than I would hope. Uh, people don't generally, I think, uh, see it as the extreme existential threat that it is that needs to be fought uh, with everything we have. And, you know, these redefinitions that are being put forward of what religious liberty means, the idea that it means evangelicals have the right to discriminate against other people or impose their beliefs upon them, that somehow 
their religious liberty is uh, more important than everybody else's li- uh, lives and rights. Um, yeah, yep. that's, that's insane. I grew up uh, Seventh-day Adventist, and while I was growing up, um, the church had its religious liberty department, and still does, that exists to help protect Adventists from discrimination. And they have also gone, um, gone to the aid of religious minorities as well. But it's basically, they exist to fight for Adventist right to not have to work on Saturday. They, but that view, at least when I, was, when I was a kid, was never that you have a right to make sure your employer doesn't open on Saturday. And that's a huge right. difference. <laughs> right, right. Or the idea that a corporation's alleged religious point of view uh, exonerates them from paying for insurance coverage for contraceptives you might use. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are very, uh, you know, these are very tenuous propositions. However, the Satanic Temple go to court, and all of a sudden, there's these very direct uh, uh, and important questions about whether or not what we're asking for is something prescriptive within our tenets or our practices or whatever, you know, and there's no question about whether Hobby Lobby can actually claim to have a set of religious beliefs or if there's anything in the Christian religion that would prevent a corporation from paying for somebody else's insurance coverage that includes contraceptives, you know, um, we're fighting against abortion restrictions that we say are a violation of the religious liberty of our membership. And then suddenly these questions come up of, well, you know, there's nothing in your tenets or practices that demand a woman get an abortion, you know, and and we just know that uh, the law isn't being applied neutrally. And that's really scary, you know, and it's just we but we've reached a scary level of a uh, a complete lack of public engagement with politics. And I think both sides of the political spectrum have just become numbed to this idea that they can't get justice within the system. On the right, you know, it's very anti-government. The government's wrong and deregulation is the only way to go. And we can't trust the government unless it's this anti-government government that, uh, <laughs> you know, comes in uh, based on the idea that they're not really politicians. And like in Trump's case, they don't actually know anything about fucking anything. Um, and on the left, you know, I get a lot of this discouraging commentary about how, you know, you can't use the system to fight the system and that kind of thing. And I think that's a very defeatist attitude. Well, yes, it absolutely is. Um, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Um, I live in Idaho. Uh, we have a shit ton of Mormons, a shit ton of evangelicals, a shit ton of, pro- of Pentecostals. and Catholics, and they run the government. Uh, mm-hmm. Or more accurately, two big agricultural companies run the government, uh, one of which is Mormon and the other of which uh, is not. And what they agree on is they don't want government regulation, but they also don't want any protections for people. How could somebody here with a Republican supermajority that on the moderate reasonable side is basically wholly owned by J.R. Simplot, and on the extreme is Heather Scott, who is full-on QAnon, tear down the government, don't wear masks, don't get vaccinated, uh, and probably a full-on white white supremacist. How how can you... uh... Yeah, how do you get a voice here? Well, I mean, it's a... Our, our system is set up, so it's supposed to be self-correcting, right? Mm-hmm. And, and what the Satanic Temple is doing is, you know, we feel that we have the law on our sides. Uh, you know, we, we, we have a constitution that really entrenches these values of pluralism and religious liberty, and we are seeing that eroded. You know, we're not yeah. seeing uh, our actual constitutional standards being upheld by Christian nationalists. And we feel that we need to assert, you know, any actual credible interpretation of our constitutional legal rights in in order for uh, things to return to a, a, 
you know, a kind of pleasant baseline here. And, and that's not always going to work, right? Because like you say, sometimes you just have, like in the case of some of the federal judges, like they, they might be white supremacists, Christian nationalists, you know, Trump appointees or whatever. Mm-hmm. But we can certainly hope that even if we get, you know, a completely unjust ruling, that it will be to to the point that uh, there will be enough outrage and uproar that at least the other judges who aren't, you know, given to these kinds of uh, uh, highly theocratic belief systems will feel emboldened to, to rule in our favor. Uh, because, you know, I, I feel like there's some kind of reservations for that now. And I feel like we're making headway in Florida. And I think, uh, you know, earlier on 2014, something like that, there in the Capitol Rotunda, they had it open for holiday displays and they had a nativity scene there. And back then we asked to put up our own display and they knew they didn't have any legal grounds to say no. So we put up a display and it caused all kinds of uproar. And at that point, there were a lot of people, Herman Cain and other politicians who openly, uh, uh, openly decried this, saying that it was, it was outrageous that Satanists were able to have a display in the Capitol Rotunda. They should have said no, you know, that the nativity scene deserves a place, but we did not. And I didn't see a whole lot of commentary, you know, uh, uh, that would have pro- that would have caused any of these people giving that commentary to go back on what they said. You know, uh, people were just just kind of viewed us as these provocateurs and uh, people who were just uh, you know just disturbing the the general peace by doing what we were doing. That changed in all of two years when in Chicago they had a similar situation. The Capitol Rotunda was opened up, and our chapter there put up this great display. And a grandstanding Illinois politician wrote some kind of public press release saying that we had no right to be there. They should have said no. And by God, you know, Satanists during Christmas time putting up a holiday display, uh, you know, we shouldn't have any of this. And by that time, you know, there were a flood of letters to the editor and, and other types of outrage saying that, you know, you're absolutely wrong. This is what religious liberty is. And the government has no place in saying otherwise, to the point that this politician walked back on what she had said and claimed that she meant something completely different. <laughs> and I think the more we do what we do, you know, the more people will see the value in that. And it's really a uh, uh, it, it, it's. Uh, given our legal structure, it's it's really different to say otherwise. I get really disappointed. Like I understand uh, pointing out how difficult and as uphill a battle as this is, but I uh, also uh, get a little disappointed in people who act as though all we can do is take to the streets and outrage, break windows, burn things down, or whatever. Because ultimately, what are you doing when you do that? Yeah, I feel like. When you go out there, your your distant hope is that the politicians will realize and comply with your demands. Mm-hmm. And I think there is less chance of that, you know, of people of people complying with the, the demands of uh, of violent protests uh, than there are with people complying to uh, our demands when we bring them into the courtroom and have our demands aligned with what the law actually is. Right. And with like the, the holiday displays as, as an example, uh, how many of them get accepted? How many get rejected? And have you had any cases where they just decide no more holiday displays? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, we've had that. We've we've had it where, you know, there's been uh, public forums opened up and they thought that they were opening up for just, you know, a particular re- religious point of view. And then when others come to join the fund, they say, all right, we're closing this down out of concern for the heckler's veto, which honestly isn't a uh, a sound legal reason to shut down a public forum. Um, That's not that's not actually in alignment with with the law. Uh, Heckler's veto is not ever considered a, a, a credible reason for censoring anybody's speech. In fact, heckler's veto being that, you know, it'll upset too many people, Mm -hmm. uh, the perspective, uh, fear that somebody will, will break something or, or whatever. Um, and we had something like that in, uh, 
Belle Plaine, Minnesota, where in Belle Plaine, this small city in Minnesota, uh, some Christian group had put a cross memorial to veterans in a park. Uh, They had never even asked for permission to place it there, but they put it there. And then a local atheist got irritated and reported it to the Freedom From Religion Foundation. The Freedom From Religion Foundation wrote to the city council there and said, this is a violation of the Establishment Clause. Take it down. So they took it down. And then uh, outside lawyers from the Alliance Defending Freedom, the ADF, mm-hmm. came over and uh, they had a, a local Christian and they went to the city council meeting and they felt that they had this really clever idea of opening up those park grounds as a f- limited public forum for veterans memorials that would be privately donated. And in that way, you know, nobody could say that this was government speech because it was privately donated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and anybody could privately donate such a, such a memorial. Well, considering us their nuclear option, the Freedom From Religion Foundation reached out uh, to me directly, <laughs> and they said, you know, do you, do you guys have any interest in putting up a veterans memorial? And we did. And not even just to test uh, the uh, allegiance to pluralism, but because we actually have a lot of veteran membership in the, in the Satanic Temple and wanted to do something for them, too. So we... Uh, requested placement in this public forum, and we sent the city our diagram of our prospective monument, and they said, yes, you'll have a year to have this monument there. So after we received their permission, we had this monument constructed, which was no small task. It's this nice steel monument uh, to veterans. And once we were ready to have it delivered, the city said, no, we're cu- well, okay, we're closing down the forum. You know, it, it, we had called their bluff and they didn't want our monument there. And so they took down the, the Christian memorial and said we couldn't have ours there either. Now, some people say we went too far and should have left it at that, but we're suing them. And <laughs> uh, I, but I, I think, you know, we have to sue them for something like that. I mean, people act as though this comes at no cost to us. You know, we, we threw in uh, some tens of thousands on putting this together based on the notion that it was going to be there for a year. And we wanted to put it there for a year. We wanted to have our public memorial up. You know, at at the end of the day, what we were asking for is what we wanted to do. And, uh, you know, we called their bluff and and then they shut it down. And the fact of the matter is, is I think that Christian monument was there for over a year. Mm -hmm. And I think they, I think we deserve as much time as that was sitting there. And that they can't just say, okay, we're packing our stuff and going home now. And now nobody gets to use the public grounds because we've had enough. I think there needs to be some kind of consequence for that. Or, you know, that's just what will happen every time. We'll have these forums opened up for as long as there's Christian expression on it. And then they'll shut them down as soon as anybody else comes along. And that can't, we can't let it stand at that. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that makes sense. Um you know, like in my mind, the, the big goal would be to not have any religious displays on public land. That would be my yeah. perfect world. Well, that's that's true. But if they're going to be there, mm-hmm. you know, it's far better to have pluralism on display than giving that appearance of one specific viewpoint, having the authorization of the government to the exclusion of the others. And I, I think, you know, there's... There's real importance, I think, to the battles we fight. People see it as this kind of, uh, you know, as this kind of petty pranksterism half the time, I think. But it's not. I think it really cuts to the core of how we conceive of ourselves as a, as a nation. And it, it really speaks to, you know, our, our fundamental values. And really, uh, you can see the type of miseducation that people suffer when you see just how people respond to the Satanic Temple putting in, in a request for equal representation, because you'll see the damage done by just putting in God we trust on money in the 50s. Mm-hmm. You can see this in the Hail Satan film, 
when we were asking to give an invocation in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where they're opening the city council meetings almost exclusively with Christian prayers. And then we came in and people were outraged that we had no right to do this because they felt that, you know, uh, uh, the, the Christians had, had a right to this and, and other groups did not. And a lot of people making public comments at the preceding hearing at the city council meeting we're holding up money and saying it says in God we trust, you know, and, and therefore, you know, they had exclusive license to that domain. And it just shows you that none of these displays or these demands to put in God we trust on anything, Ten Commandments or anything else, are these kind of benign symbolic ceremonial gestures. They're stepping stones to other things. A Ten Commandments monument goes up on the Capitol grounds. It doesn't end with that. And it, it's never been intended that it ends with that. Then having it there is used as evidence that our laws are based upon Christian precepts and that further adjudication should be based upon Christian ideals, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes towards justifying prohibitions against uh, sexual identity and, and uh, sexual orientation. Um, uh, it goes it goes towards arguments about legislating abortion. It goes towards a whole agenda that has a real uh, a, a real a real theocratic design behind it. Oh, and sorry. I think you know on the front line of this, you know, at the basic level. You know, we're trying to nip that in the bud by yeah. asserting the pluralism now. Um, a, a great example of it would be right where I live. The state legislature can look up from their offices at Table Rock up above town and see a giant cross on top of it. And it right. was an illegal land. It was illegally placed on public land. And then there was an illegal land sale that by the time there was a lawsuit about that, it had been 20 years and the courts basically said it was too late. It was private property. Right. They, they like to do that, too. We'll, we'll, yeah. They'll say something's, something's been around too long now to be considered uh, religious. Uh, somehow it's secularized through time because it becomes a historical landmark. And we saw that in, uh, I believe it was Maryland, Bladensburg. There's a big yeah. concrete cross, uh, and it was a cross erected to honor World War I veterans mm -hmm. or fallen soldiers from World War I. And the kind of uh, ridiculous arguments being made uh, just to justify this clearly religious iconography being put up on the public grounds, I think really got into dangerous territory. Um, it really put the burden of proof somewhere where it didn't belong, I think. If you yeah. read the opinions uh, put forward, the majority opinion, put forward as to why they allow that cross to stay. For, for, for one, they say it has a secular purpose of worshiping, you know, the fallen soldiers and, you know, the, the grave markers were often a cross or whatever. And they say that it's, it's a historical landmark now because it's been there for so long. It's been there for like 70 years or whatever. But, you know, if it was illegal then, it's illegal now. And I don't see how you can say that, you know, uh, something uh, gets past some kind of statute of limitations on something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the argument that there was no evidence of discriminatory intent is what really bothers me, because we're seeing that more and more, too, to the point that it feels like the courts are going to side with these kinds of evangelical encroachments so long as nobody involved is explicitly on record saying, you know, we're going to put this Christian monument, memorial, or other type of expression here in public because fuck everybody else, you know, and Christianity is the best and everybody should be a Christian. There is no acknowledgement to the fact that it can be discriminatory regardless of the intent of the people who put it up, that it just can be discriminatory in fact, that it can create a discriminatory environment. And I feel like it's kind of a novel legal theory to say that discrimination doesn't exist unless somebody openly and flatly states it on the record. Yeah, and, and the Supreme Court's also been presenting this crazy idea of 
hostility towards religion as a problem. Right. And their notion of what's discrimination or, you know, what's hostile to religion is sometimes just the basic life, lives and, mm -hmm. and presence of other people. And when it's most infuriating is when they are making arguments for the discrimination against people of certain sexual uh, orientation or identity. And, and, you know, religious liberty was never supposed to mean a diminishment of anybody else's liberty. And to contextualize it like that, I think, is just an outrageous insult to everything we were premised upon. And I, that, that, I think, goes back again to, you know, getting the system to recognize what the system is and litigating these types of things. I get really disappointed when people pretend like that's the kind of system we have and that this kind of system is given to this oppression. It's not. I, I really feel like we're explicitly a nation that, uh, that uh, respects pluralism. We haven't done a good job of it, but we need to demand it. And we really do have the fundamentals of law on our side. If you're having to try to, to make an argument that you are opposed to religious influence in government or pro-religious action of government because it violates the Establishment Clause, but you have to simultaneously argue that your argument, which is inherently in the negative, um, doesn't infringe on anybody else's religious liberty and isn't in any way hostile to, towards religion, which if it's American Atheists or Freedom from Religion Foundation, it's definitely going to be viewed as hostility towards religion. Well, Catherine Stewart is, is, is author of a book called The Power Worshippers, and she also authored a book called The Good News Clubs about these evangelical mm -hmm. school clubs being placed into public schools. And she pointed out that uh, the Good News Club's Supreme Court ruling, which uh, ended up being, you know, finding in their favor that they had a right to put these religious clubs in the public schools, because to not allow that was religious discrimination, was part of a real downward spiral of turning religion into this kind of super class, right? Yeah. Like religious, religion now has expanded. Uh, it's, it's free speech rights in the context of religion that other people just don't have. And it was never discriminatory for schools to say that they weren't going to have religious clubs in the schools. They can categorically deny certain things. They can say that they're not going to have political clubs because they don't want to deal with the communist kids club, the Nazi kids club, <laughs> whatever, because they open that door uh, you know, they should have to accept any of those. And they don't want that. And for good reason, they shouldn't have it. And they shouldn't have to manage that kind of controversy in the schools. You can categorically say you don't have religion in the schools in the same way. When it's religious discrimination is when you say, we'll allow religious clubs, but only Christian religious clubs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, following the Supreme Court ruling that said, it was religious discrimination to not allow the good news clubs. What happens? The satanic temple comes along mm -hmm. with after school Satan clubs where we were clear that we weren't even going to talk about uh, items of religious opinion, but just wanted a counterbalance to the good news clubs where kids could uh, engage in self-directed learning and build their critical thinking skills. And yet this is considered outrageous. They don't want a, a, sat a satanic club in the schools. And they don't uh, and they deny that they open the door for that by having the good news clubs there to begin with. Mm -hmm. That's religious discrimination. It was never religious discrimination to say no religious clubs. It's religious discrimination right. when they say the satanic temple is not invited and need not apply. And that's the situation we're in now is getting people to see that, getting people to learn that and getting mm -hmm. people to realize that. Well, and, and the beauty of, of your position in all of this is. It's a positive argument in favor of religious liberty. Right. right. We, we really do stand for religious liberty. And that's why I'm infuriating to some of the conservative talking heads when I go on their shows, 
Mm -hmm. because it makes them very uncomfortable that I'll get on Fox News or whatever, and I'll be using the language of free speech. I'm using the language of religious liberty. I'm using the language of constitutional rights. And they want to use those arguments. They've always used them disingenuously, though, and they have a real difficult time of it when I come on. And that's the rhetoric I'm using because they feel like it's been stolen from them. And if you want to see some comical examples of that, go to YouTube and check out both of the times I was on the Tucker Carlson show <laughs> and the ways I made him try, you know, made him grapple with his cognitive dissonance. <laughs> he really seems to be the new Bill O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. No, I I honestly didn't realize he was as bad as he was, uh, even at the time I had done both of his shows. <laughs> I, I uh, just recently watched a Daily Show compilation where he was, they were putting together things he had said and his his hostility to diversity mm -hmm. is really... Uh, is really concerning to me. And, you know, I, I don't like to go the route of reading deeply into, you know, notions of tacit racism and stuff like that, but it's not too tacit when it comes to, no. to Tucker Carlson. I mean, this absolute fear that there's going to be a diminishment of what he considers American culture and, and kind of contextualizing that American culture as being uh, uh, free of, of brown people um, is 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 really outrageous. I, 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 I'm, it's really disheartening that we've gone because I, I feel like we've taken so many steps backward. You know, I, I, a lot of people will say that you know it's always been this way, but I, I don't feel like it was it was this bad just pre-Trump. No, like one way I, I know I've been. I, I feel like people, even on Fox, used to lose their jobs for saying the type of yeah. stupid, crass shit that uh, Tucker Carlson says now. They had to use code words to say white supremacist stuff on TV. Yeah, but if they failed to, at least people got in outrage enough and advertisers yeah. pulled out. Now it's, it seems like it's the norm. Now they can say it openly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that has definitely changed. That is, that is, it was not that way prior to 2017. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and it's disheartening and, uh, you know, not to get too tangential, but I do, I do blame a lot of it on the corruption of the internet, uh, of the information environment by the tech companies and how they've sequestered us into these algorithmic bubbles and, you know, the, the direct marketing, uh, the direct surveillance marketing tactics they use to, you know, get everybody pushed to their most extreme yeah, the uh, which theoretically should have been good for you. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem like it yeah. has, though. Yeah, no, I, I well, it's so bizarre. Uh, like I was kind of alluding to earlier, I, I feel like we're at this point now where we feel like we're the ones trying to be the adults in the room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the Satanists before felt like the outrageous freaks and the rock stars, you know? Yeah. And now I feel like we're the ones saying like, all right, everybody take a deep breath and try to think about things in the context of following things in a principled way. And let's all, you know, and let's acknowledge that there's no more adults in the room anymore and that we need to clean up here, you know, and, and be responsible for our own lives because we've seen such an abdication of that at even the highest levels that everything's been turned upside down. And I don't know where that ultimately goes, but it might lead much quicker to the possibility and prospect of somebody openly being a Satanist and running for office. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, it's a lot to consider. Yeah. And it's, it is crazy that the, because, because what you, what you, um, eloquently said about, we need more adults in the room. If you're saying that on social media or YouTube, that doesn't increase engagement. Saying right. crazy shit increases engagement. Right. And, you know, that's a that's a known component of the social uh, media environment. Mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, Facebook ran their own studies on. And, you know, they, they intentionally uh, amplify the most outrageous posts because they know they know they get engagement, you know, and, and I do think a lot of the problem we're dealing with now with everybody going to the most extreme extreme 
uh, in grandstanding and, and very unproductive ways uh, with non-solutions and, and you know outright calling for c- civil war um, it is a real product of that. Uh, the gamification of opinion uh, yeah. all boiled down to you know 140 characters or whatever else is has been. Uh, I, I mean, we're seeing the outcome of that now and mm-hmm. seeing just how important this kind of bizarre propag- propaganda. You know, even unconscious, you know, the algorithmic propaganda cycle, how destructive that is. And, I, I you know, something needs to be done to, to rein that in. If uh, the Biden administration doesn't work quickly to start regulating the tech giants, you know, there, things aren't going to be better. And uh, the next, uh, I, I'm really afraid of the next GOP president because mm-hmm. The best thing about Donald Trump was that he was really stupid yep. and that he really wasn't able to see through a lot of his ideas if he had ideas at all, other right. than just kind of elevating himself as this king of the United States. What I fear is that Trump showed the next person who's mm-hmm. going to be a lot smarter just how much they can get away with. And it's a lot. All it would have taken would have been a little better organization on January 6th, a little better cooperation with their allies that they had in, you know, Trump's people's allies in the Capitol Police that helped them, Mm -hmm. and a little bit of uh, coordination with the right person in the military, and it would have been a successful coup. Right, no, and that's that's part of the the argument that the best thing about Trump was how dumb he was. He was... uh, Mm -hmm. He was completely incapable of building the proper alliances that would have seen this this kind of coup through. Um, he definitely had the will for it. He just didn't have the wherewithal. He didn't have the wit, and he didn't have the organizational skills. Um, he he's a complete idiot, and anybody who thinks otherwise is an idiot too. But um, like I said, the next person who comes around could only be smarter than Trump. But Trump laid a real groundwork in just showing how far you can go and get away with it. Right. And even in like the best case scenario of what a Mike Pence presidency as an example would look like, one area that has me kind of worried is the necessary regulation that we need Biden to do to fix the issues with the internet could very easily give the Whoever follows him, the opportunity to turn it into a tool to punish anybody who's not a white Christian. Well, there is precedent for autocratic regimes using Mm -hmm. the tech giants to support their regimes. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot written about that and about how certain uh, governments have essentially uh, taken over Facebook and their countries or certain parties have. And Facebook's done almost nothing to mitigate that. And we have these kinds of show hearings in Congress where every so often they'll have the tech giant CEOs come in and ask them to explain certain things where, I mean, at a certain point, I'm not, ter- I'm not sympathetic to the CEOs, but just the same, you can't expect them to self-impose any limits on themselves because they know they're in a, a Darwinistic environment where if they don't do it, the other guy will. And if mm-hmm. it's going to get them ahead, uh, they'll be beat out, you know. And I was reading uh, a book by, you know, former head of the uh, FDA who was talking about how, you know, a lot of companies that engage in uh, unsafe practices with their products, you know, have carcinogens in them or whatever else. They are not always uh, opposed to being regulated, you know, and they're they're not they're they're not always kind of pushing back against it, and they don't uh, they don't always dislike the idea, mm-hmm. um, but you know, until they're regulated, they're simply not going to be able to follow this kind of self regulation because, like I said. You know, th- then it just gives somebody else the advantage and they, they, they want a level playing field. You know, there, there was a book called, uh, I think, The Darwin Economy that was talking about a certain point in time in the, in the NHL where uh, some players were wearing face guards and others weren't. And the ones who weren't 
felt that it gave them a mobility advantage. You know, it, uh, it, 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 they felt less restricted in that way, but they also felt they were more available to injury Mm -hmm. and they were worried about that. And they were all almost universally happy when the NHL NHL said, all right, you all have to wear face masks Mm -hmm. because then they felt they weren't at any disadvantage by using it. They just felt that they were safer. And I feel like we've really lost that sense in the United States from years and years of this propaganda that uh, that our rights are boiled down to the rights of corporations to be entirely deregulated and our individual rights don't mean much. Um, and those are subject to the regulation of uh, Christian belief system. And I think that's really the direction we've been going for some time. Absolute corporate autonomy and rights while we have these uh, social prohibitions imposed on us individually by a theocratic group of politicians who want to legislate our bedroom morals. Yeah, well, and like, I used to work for one of, in one of the most heavily regulated industries. It's uh, part of the biologics subset of pharmaceuticals, where every imaginable element of it is regulated and inspected. And we had inspections from the state, we had inspections from the FDA, from uh, industry organizations from the European Medicines Agency, from customers, like we got inspected all the time. And the biggest way to minimize the advancement of regulation in that kind of environment is to self-regulate to the point where the regulators see that you have effective procedures to comply with the law and effective management to ensure compliance with your own procedures. And then they just want to make sure you're doing it. If companies were to voluntarily take the right steps, the need for regulation could actually be pulled back, but they don't because it's it cuts down on profit. Right. And that's why I feel like these hearings they have in Congress when they have like Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, Apple CEO, Google CEO, all sitting there and answering to standard business practices that we can fully expect from them if their motivation is simply profit and uh, expecting them to do differently is just it's ridiculous and it's outrageous and it's just it's just a way i think of giving the appearance of some kind of uh of some kind of oversight that just doesn't exist you know and if if nothing's nothing's done to regulate it then nothing's going to happen either. And these things are going to keep happening again and again. And it's, it's horrific to me that we've seen what's happened with the information environment based upon these algorithmic bubbles and based upon the surveillance marketing uh, structure of the tech companies. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen these outcomes and we still just depend on the companies themselves to manage this, regulate this, and somehow rectify it. And right now, literally, people are dying because of it, because of the spread of anti-vax and anti-mask propaganda. People are actively dying of of COVID-19 that wouldn't have if not for stuff being spread on Facebook. And Yeah, no, COVID, uh, I mean, COVID has really offered us an insight into, uh, you know, the public understanding of, of events uh, and just how, how poorly managed it is. And to this day, I, I do not see much in the way of public advocacy for getting the vaccine. You know, we're pretty much left towards to people's own interpretations of what's, uh, what's safe, what's reliable, and, and what's the appropriate thing to do. And I feel like even in my own circles on social media, it seems like it's fairly unpopular to say, yes, you should get vaccinated. And there should be a lot more people saying that. We're at about half a million people dead just in the United States. And you still have people denying that the pandemic is even a thing. You have people saying, we don't know the long-term effects of uh, of the vaccine. And it's like, come on, that's a pretty outdated perspective now. At this point, we have millions of people vaccinated, and for all intents and purposes, we've had nothing wrong with it, right? And mm-hmm. we do not know the long-term effects of COVID, but we know that people are having long-term effects that are 
no good at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there seems to be something really wrong with this, you know, and, and you're better off not getting it. And plus, you know, if we have a significant enough population that refuses to get vaccinated, we're almost certain to get a resistant variant yeah. to the point where we all, we, we never get out of this because people just can't get their, you know, wrap their brains around it. So public messaging is just horrific right now. And we're just relying upon, you know, uh, essentially relying upon the tech companies where everybody gets their news from anymore mm -hmm. to somehow get the right message out. And it's just not happening. Now, I think some of it is that there might be a, a part of it might be an intentional vacuum on not trying to pump up the demand before the supply is available. But what is getting missed with that is because nobody's pumping up the demand for it, you've got almost all of the volume on don't get the shot. Right. And that's, right. that's really bad. Right. And, and I also worry that when we get to the point where things start lifting again, people will just be all too quick to act as though this is entirely over and that they really have no need to be vaccinated either mm -hmm. well before we've reached herd immunity. And that, that's a terrifying prospect, too, because I, I just, like I said, I just hate the idea of coming out of the other end of this and then getting a variant where we start all over again. And, you know, that's a distinct possibility right now. The especially terrifying thing with that is healthcare workers were first, which means if we get a vaccine resistant variant, then they're the ones that are, that are going to get exposed to it and not have any protection to it. Right. I, I'm also I, I kind of kind of tangentially, I'm kind of disappointed of the way we treat retail workers around here. They're not anywhere on the schedule. You know, you have people who live their lives and, and earn their wages by serving the public and they're expected to go out and be exposed to that. And they just have to wait in line like anybody else. We, we have a real history of just shitting all over retail workers. And I don't know what that's about. People need to People need to stop that, <laughs> you know? Right. We, well, like, and, and I, my, my official position on it is you get the shot when it's your turn to get the shot, and it's not up to you to decide when it's your turn. I still have a problem with the fact that my turn already happened, and the person, person at the checkout at Albertsons, that person's turn hasn't happened yet. Right. I, I mean, they, at the very least, we should be considering the fact that Retail employees have the potential to infect many more people too. You know, they're they're yeah. naturally exposed to people. So why don't we why don't we bump them up in the line a little bit? Where like, I, I do work for a hospital, but I don't ever interact with patients. And I've been working from home throughout the pandemic. I should have been much lower on the priority, but again, that wasn't my choice. Right. All right. No, I'll, <laughs> I'll get it when I can get it. But yeah, I, I do think we have just kind of a long-standing tradition in the United States of people feeling like uh, retail workers are there for them to berate, uh, look mm -hmm. down upon. And, and I think that goes like from the bottom up, you know, people are always shitting on the retail workers. <laughs> and wait staff at restaurants as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I consider them in the same, mm -hmm. same category, you know, and, and, and it's, I don't know. The point maybe is that's, maybe that's the take home message. Like, yeah. Be nice to the be nice <laughs> to the waiters, waiter, waitresses, and, and retail workers. Why don't you? All right. So shifting gears, um, I wasn't expecting you to respond as quickly as you did. So thank you very much on that. Um, I am doing a little bit of a mini series on the podcast on Satanism. Um, so last week I talked about the Church of Satan, and then we're getting the Satanic Temple, and I'll be doing, it was going to be in between the two, but now it'll be after this one. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the Satanic Panic. Um, in your mind, compare the Satanic Temple to the Church of Satan. Well, the Church of Satan, as people know, was founded in 1966, or maybe they don't know. <clears throat> uh, if they but listen it... to last week's episode, they do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, our kind of people look at the Satanic Temple and the Church of Satan and consider our core values very much aligned in that we're uh, ostensibly non theistic. I mean, we're non theistic, but there's, you know, questions about the, uh, the, the kind of adherence to supernaturalism 
uh, that the that the Church of Satan has. But on on the surface of it, you know, we don't. Neither of us believe in a literal Satan, and most modern Satanists uh, do not. And we're I think considered. This, I think the best way to d- differentiate that is both are non-theistic. The Satanic Temple is purely naturalistic, whereas the Church of Satan definitely has some supernatural elements. Well, they don't like to use the word supernaturalism, but then they have <laughs> yeah. ideas that are clearly uh-huh. supernaturalist, right? That because there's they, magic in the occult that just isn't understood. Right, yes. right. They, they, they have magic, um, but according to them, you know, there's a, a naturalistic explanation for the uh, uh, supernormal powers conferred mm-hmm. by them, which is just kind of like a semantic workaround to say, you know, we don't, we don't espouse supernaturalism. However, right. this magic can't be explained yet, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And it's, that's a little silly, but, really um, <laughs> but also like, uh, we both kind of, we're both considered left-hand path religions where we don't subjugate ourselves to some kind of higher divine authority, but the religion is about bettering the self and about personal autonomy. But from there, the differences are pretty severe because the Church of Satan venerates authoritarianism. And there was a lot of writings from the Church of Satan uh, kind of aligning themselves with police state politics. And their idea of individualism is such that, you know, there's uh, uh, there's there's a stratification, you know, in the uh, in the superior people who have this kind of right to lord over the unwashed, and uneducated masses. Right, and you have to have thing. achievement and advancement in the outside world before you can get any advancement within the church. Right, and they also have, uh, uh, y- you know, they. They have these premises in place, and they have, a, I think, they, their, uh, their belief system is more explicitly political than ours, but they like to claim that they're apolitical uh, for the fact that they just don't get involved in politics. You know, mm-hmm. they, they, don't, they don't actually do anything to see through their stated agenda. Um, and, I mean, it needs to be said that they don't, they aren't federally recognized as a as a church, uh, and and they'll claim that they they they're not because they they don't believe that churches should be exempt from taxes and things like that. Which mm-hmm. I mean, that's fine. Uh, they don't. They also don't have a physical location. They also don't congregate. They also just don't. They don't. They don't do things. You know, they they're not. They, they claim they could be considered a, a federally recognized religion, but they don't meet any of the criteria. And I know this because we do, you know, we, we yeah. filled out those materials and we know what the, the points are. So at this point, the Church of Satan is kind of a website and a Twitter feed. And they, I don't think they would exist if it weren't for the Internet now. So, is it greatly di- so it's greatly diminished from what it was back during Anton LaVey's heyday. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty yeah. much a Twitter feed now. I, yeah. I don't see much more evidence that there's that there's much else to it. You know, they so, have a website where they sell membership cards for over two hundred dollars, and you know, it, 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 and and I I wouldn't be uh uh you know I don't I don't care if there's varieties of Satanism, right? I'm not here saying like uh, the Satanic Temple is true Satanism or whatever, but there's Church of Satan will definitely do that. They say that we're not real Satanists because we're not Levian. And uh, uh, now, you know, they're pretty much their primary activity is decrying on Twitter the things that the Satanic Temple does. And, <laughs> and sometimes to me in the most disgraceful ways, you know, like when we were uh, uh, fighting abortion restrictions in Missouri, you know, uh, the Church of Satan was direct tweeting to uh, the attorney general over there, like making the case that we're inauthentic, you know, trying to undermine our case, oh, wow. you know, that kind of thing. And th- those are the types of things I have no, no real yeah. sympathy for. I, I would not be motivated to speak ill of another organization, but at the point where they are really trying to undermine us in mm-hmm. our fight for keeping uh, equal rights for people, 
And, you know, especially for the rights of individuals to identify as Satanists and to have other self-identified Satanists trying to undermine that for some type of feeling of being uh, upstaged or something like that. That's uh, uh, that to me, I, I can't justify. Yeah. And the, the Church of Satan pre-existed the Satanic Temple by quite a few decades. Was there, did they provide any inspiration or was it purely coincidental to go with Satan? Well, no, it wasn't purely coincidental. I grew up uh, in the midst of the Satanic Panic, and, you know, I was a kid, so I would take some of these claims seriously. And it wasn't until later, you know, and I'm becoming really skeptical of supernatural claims in general, and specifically uh, Christian claims that I was kind of indoctrinated into as a child, and also learning that all these claims of Satanic panic or bullshit, I think really contributed to me having growing a really deep affinity for the idea of Satanism. And I began looking for who the Satanists were, and I found the Church of Satan. And, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, did not disagree with a lot of the propositions put forth by the, the Church of Satan. So I just didn't know better. You know, these are like, factual claims about uh, 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 about social Darwinism removed from racist ideologies and things like that. But this is how society operates and the nature of altruism and things like that. But the more I come to learn about, you know, cognitive psychology and, and, and reciprocal altruism and things like that, the more these kinds of theories fell apart and the more further removed I felt from Levian ideas and ideals. And ultimately, you know, that kind of satanic reformation is what formed the satanic temple. And it has a lot to do with me turning my back on those philosophies of Levianism. It was what made the satanic temple relevant. So I certainly can't say, you know, that uh, the, the Church of Satan had nothing to do with informing the satanic temple. But it did, uh, in certain ways, in, in a negative way. And, I mean, it has to be said, you know, in LeVay's defense, um, the only personal friends of his that I've ever talked to and met were under the impression that LeVay would have been amenable to changing his viewpoints and that he was far more liberal than his social policy views may have indicated mm. and that they really felt that he would applaud what the satanic temple are doing for whatever that's worth, okay. you know, cause I know so LeVay had some uh, pretty poor ideas about things, but you know, far be it from me. I don't know his character as a person personally, but you know, people who were close to him and, and embrace the satanic temple now or, or did before they died, uh, you know, felt that there was a chance that he would have he would have liked us hmm. yeah and so yeah the connection there isn't zero but not huge right well i mean it's like asking us how much of our philosophy is dictated by the christian religion and our rejection to it and it's like we can know consciously to a certain degree but also you know, my introduction to Satanism was through Levianism. Mm -hmm. And even I have to guess as to how much of that was influential in what I'm doing, right? You, you know, you, you can't always parse that. You, you, you know uh, the environment you were in. You know, I can only acknowledge what I knew. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so if people want to find out more about the Satanic Temple, where can they go? Go to thesatanictemple.com or, you know, follow us on Twitter at at satanic underscore temple underscore. And, you know, you can pretty much keep up to date on our on our campaigns and our works. I would say find us on Facebook, but I'm, I still hold out the hope that Facebook will be destroyed soon enough. <laughs> um, I'll link to your Web page and Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm soon going to be stripping all Facebook links off my website. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Yeah, I think that I I like to hear that. That's a trend. Yep. <laughs> uh, and 
Uh, you've got chapters in how many cities at this point? Uh, I don't even know. Like, you, if you go to our website, uh, there's a drop down menu that says, you know, where you can find uh, local affiliates near you. And uh, that number is always growing, ever expanding. We have a council that, uh, that does the interview process and the vetting process to make sure that they, you know, understand our standards and that type of thing. Um, but we're worldwide now, and uh, you know we're we're over a quarter million in our our membership. Oh wow! Um, so as far as growing religions go, uh, I think we're we're on the map. Even though you know the pew poles haven't really caught up or, or recognized it yet, mm-hmm. um, I think academics of new religions are starting to realize it. And some people might not know, but Oxford University Press 2019 released a book about us, too, written by a religion scholar, a Catholic religion scholar, who's, who's actually a friend of mine, uh, Joe Laycock, um, oh. out of uh, a university in Texas, and it's called Speak of the Devil, and it's a good kind of uh, documentation of uh, the rise of the Satanic Temple and questions about uh, uh, questions we raise about religion and politics all right yeah and, and you've got a, a chapter in idaho now oh see i, I couldn't have even told you that yeah. it, it's uh it's more than uh you know than any one person could manage <laughs> uh, I, I i know one of the well kind of know one of the 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 heads of it so that's that's how oh, I, good. I found out <laughs> um all right so if do you have anything else you want to plug no i don't think so uh <laughs> I, I think that's good. Um, yeah, let me know when this goes live, and I'll, I'll be happy to share it on my social media. All right. Uh, th- that should be this Thursday. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, chat with you so, so, in, in another couple of years or so. <laughs> yeah. Or, right. or anytime, you know, just reach out anytime. Yeah, we will do. All right, now it's time for some feedback, and I definitely seem to hit a nerve. So these were all about last week's episode, episode 395. So from Cecil via YouTube, in response to episode 395, The Church of Satan, if you're a former, you would never really a member brother. Hope you find your way, God bless. And then again, y'all are clowns. Well, Cecil, fuck off. In more serious comments from Noel via a comment on the website, And there's actually two of these that I will read both of them. Hi, guys. I love your podcast and appreciate your informal but informed approach. Listening to episode 395, the English teacher me bristled a bit, though. I value your thorough and focused efforts to inform your listeners. I had to comment on the spellings and meanings of Calvary versus Cavalry. They are not spelled the same. Cavalry, that's C-A-V-A-L-R-Y, equals battle troops on horseback. In modern usage, bring on... The cavalry means let's go to war slash battle, often met metaphorically. Calvary, C-A-L-V-A-R-Y, proper noun, capitalized, is, as you know, the name given in the Bible to the hill where Christ was crucified. In modern usage, it is often used to suggest someone's being punished. The two words are sometimes confused. It's the V-A-L versus L-V-A segments of the words that are sometimes confusing. They are not interchangeable. Knowing you do have great religious knowledge, as you show in the segments where you dust off your degree, I wanted to pass this along to you. Your podcast is regularly on my listening list of atheist podcasts. Thank you so much for your time and obvious hard work you put into them. Stay safe and keep podcasting your great show. And then a follow-up on that one was, I'm the person who wrote about the use of Calvary versus Cavalry in episode 395. I have to blushingly take back everything I'd said in clarifying the difference to you. (laughs) You did understand the difference. It was the people who talked about it and quoted it who got it wrong. Color me red with embarrassment. And then we got one from Paige via the contact form. Good evening. Please correct on the next episode the air regarding cavalry versus calvary. You said it wasn't a matter of different spelling. It absolutely is. They are different words. Please look up cavalry versus calvary. Calvary. Great show, by the way. I'm a newer listener. I like your format. Enjoy both personalities. Thank you. Okay, so I got confused. The article I was going off of talking about it was definitely confused. The lawyer covering it was confused. Trump was definitely confused. 
and the person who did the initial tweet was confused. And some listeners, including an English teacher, also got confused. Uh, um, yeah, it, I agree. It's embarrassing. Uh, consider my educational background as a major in theology with minors in history and biblical languages. I should have known the difference. My favorite stuff in history was all the military battles, especially the ones with cavalry. I had had just enough to drink and was just tired enough, and the articles were just confusing enough that I couldn't keep that straight. VAL versus LAV is something that has always been hard for me. Those kinds of arrangements of letters. Uh, I, I got tested in college for dyslexia, and turned out, no, I do not have dyslexia. I do have a tendency to transpose the second and third letter. But that's not dyslexia. Um, I, my English teachers all were super frustrated with how I did in English classes because of the crazy amount of mistakes I would do. I did great in all the other classes. I just always did terrible in English. And then I took Greek and that helped how well I do with the English language. I had to learn a lot more English grammar and stuff. Didn't help with spelling, that's for sure. And then I studied Hebrew. And when you're looking at ancient languages, and especially ancient Semitic languages, where the vowels all shift around, and even with Greek, with the conjugations and declensions, the words change, the letters all change. Any improvement in my spelling in college was destroyed by studying dead languages. It is something that has always been uh, a source of trouble and embarrassment for me. Uh, I did blogging for a while, and it's one of the reasons why I went ahead and stopped doing much blogging and switched more to doing podcasting. Because there'd be times where I would have to go with a stupider, go with a much simpler word than what I wanted to use, because I couldn't figure out how to spell the word unless it was a super academic word that nobody's going to understand. It was just one of those kind of middle ones. I couldn't spell it well enough for spell check to help out. And that's, that's a problem I have always had trouble with. So I'm sorry about the confusion. And yes, cavalry and calvary are different. And then Paige uh, sent another message using the contact form on the website. How can you say religion and politics are not completely intertwined? Paraphrasing. The reason Republicans are pushing the laws they are is basically because of the religious beliefs, patriarchal, anti-women, anti-LGBTQ, anti-people of color, anti-bodily bodily autonomy, anti-science, anti-secular education. I understand that you don't want to get too political, but you cannot say they aren't related. We are where we are in nearly all societies on this planet because of patriarchy and the holy books that they use to support their vile actions. Still enjoy your podcast. All right, Paige, in your last comment, you did say that you are a relatively new listener, which means you have probably missed on... How often I say that the Republican Party has been completely taken over by evangelicals. There is, yeah, I, I have never said that they are, that religion and politics are not intertwined. There is a lot of that. Unfortunately, there's a lot of that in the Democratic Party as well. The point I was trying to make is I made a, have made a conscious effort throughout the entire life of the podcast to try to only cover political stories if there is an atheist, humanist, or skeptical angle on that story. This is not just a politics podcast. I had thought about doing a politics podcast, but I decided to stick with this because it's important to keep the focus on political issues that are relevant to atheism and humanism and skepticism. So examples would be tax plans, usually, most of them are not necessarily re relevant to atheism, humanism, or skepticism. So that's outside of the purview of this podcast. Trump's Muslim ban was definitely a church-state separation and humanist issue. So we did talk about that. Um, yeah, politics and religion have always been intertwined. We need to fix that. But a big part of trying to fix that is making sure that people are paying attention to where they're intertwined and not saying it's all completely 100% intertwined. We need to get the wall of separation rebuilt, and we need to get the parties way more secularized. The current issue, best I can tell, is that Republicans are the God Party, 
and Democrats don't want to be viewed by moderates as being anti-religion. So they're embracing more and more religion. We need that to not happen. We need to make sure that we're calling out Democrats when they are pulling up spouting off religious bullshit, but we also need to get back to a point where the Republican Party is not just a tool of evangelical and conservative Christianity. And if we just blur all the lines, we're never going to be able to fix those issues. Um, if we can focus on the parts that are the problem, that problem, um, and, and we specifically need to get the religious intertwining out so that we can have reasonable rational conversations to come up with reasonable and fact-based compromises to make good evidence-based policies. And that definitely means we need to get firm, solid church-state separation back. So I hope that clarifies things. (laughs) If you want to contact us, you can use the form on the website or leave us a message using the SpeakPipe button. You can also send us an email at feedback at atheistnomads.com. If you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate. And until next week, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.